<clears throat> Excellent. Good morning, everyone who is who is here again and who are watching us offline. This is lecture 22 in high dimensional probability. If you are watching off, us offline and if you can join, please do so. Every time, every class after the class, I would like to meet with, with one person um, uh, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, just, just to talk uh, more informally and just to get to know you. Uh, so please, if you, if you can join online uh, sometimes, that will be most useful. And yeah, and this is our, our class where last time we, 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 um, we did a linear algebra review. And just to, 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 to remind, uh, the most important thing, I think, in linear algebra is representation of matrices. It's how do you represent matrices um, via spectral decomposition. So if A is a, if, if A is a symmetric matrix, Then, then there is spectral decomposition. So A can be represented as a sum of eigenvalues times, and you create like little matrices out of eigenvalues, UI, UI transpose in matrix form, it's U lambda, U transpose. So lambda I's are eigenvec, eigen, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We always arrange them in the, in the decrease, non-increasing order. So lambda one is the top eigenvalue. In general, if A is a non-symmetric and possibly a rectangular matrix, we have a similar decomposition, but it can be symmetric, of course. So U i's and v, and v j's could be v i's could be different. They're still called left and right singular singular values and vectors, V transpose, and these are singular values and singular vectors. Both eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and singular values, singular values, have geometric meaning. So they kind of have optimization meaning. The largest eigenvalue, which we denote by lambda one, because we decrease, we, we arrange them this way, is can be computed by, by maximizing the quadratic form v transpose a v over all unit vectors v, and the largest and the, the corresponding eigenvector is a maximizer of that form. And then it goes down, then we maximize. Then we take that vector away. So we project onto the residual, project onto the orthogonal space. And again, maximize, take the maximum, but now on V orthogonal to V1 unit. And we get the second eigenvalue and the second eigenvector and so on and so forth. And the similar story goes for for the singular vectors and singular values, sigma one. So same story, except we maximize a v, just the norm of a v. And v one is the arc max of that, and so on and so forth. So this was last we we did this last time, and also last time we started to discuss matrix norms. The idea is to put a norm on the space of matrices so we can compare to it. We can legitimately say that these two matrices look similar or look, look close to each other, or these two matrices are very different. We will need this in order to uh, bound errors in statistical estimation. When we do some statistical procedures, we would like to estimate some matrices. And I would say, okay, this is actually a good estimation. But for that, I need to, I need some notion of the distance between the matrices. And there are two notions that stand out. One is the Frobenius norm, which is, which, um, um, which is computed by just looking at, at the, as a matrix as a long vector. 
think of a matrix as a vector and take the Euclidean norm L2 norm. So just sum all the entries squared, sum them up as if it was a long, long vector, and that's a Frobenius norm squared. Uh, remarkably, this norm can be both represented in terms of entries of A, which it is definitely, which is defined, and in terms of the spectrum. So it's also obtained, can also be obtained by summing the singular values squared. It's super useful for that way because it works in both domains. <clears throat> and today we continue with matrix norms. We, we note that in fact, the largest, not only the sum of all singular values, but the largest singular value by itself is also a norm. And that's called the operator norm. The operator norm, also known as spectral norm uh, of A is, is defined as, uh, as the largest singular value uh, of A, which by this optimization meaning, I just rewrite it here, it will be the maximum over all unit vectors like this. And sometimes it is useful to get rid of the unit vector assumption, get rid of this norm. And for that, I just, now I, I'm, I don't restrict x, the norm of x. It could be arbitrary, but I divide by x to normalize. And you can check that, that this is the same. Just rescale x this way and then we get the same result. If you know a little bit of functional analysis or, or uh, real analysis in that uh, way, you can recognize this as an operator norm, the, the norm of an operator between two norm spaces. In fact, both of them are L, L2 spaces. But if you don't know, that's, that's fine. So that's the operator norm. And clearly, let's see. So I'll look. How do we compare operator and Frobenius norm? It's I'm claiming that it is that the operator is smaller, but not by much, by root let's say n times a. And why is that? Let's see, that should be easy, right? Well, if, it's, if you square all the terms, so the, the left side is this. First is a top singular value, sigma one. That's the left side. Proof. And this is the sum of all of them. And this is a root n, so I'm squaring this. So this is n times the largest one. All right. I just reinterpreted this in, in terms of the spectrum, and now it's clear, right? <laughs> This inequality should be clear. The sigma one is uh, is just one of them. Of course, it's smaller than the sum of all of them. That's obvious. And the sum of n numbers is smaller than n times the largest number. Yeah, <laughs> the sum of n numbers. Each of them is bounded by sigma one. So that's it. QED. So these two norms are equivalent, but there is some factoring. Good, done. Linear algebra review over. <laughs> Crash course in linear, linear algebra is over. Uh, any, any questions? Okay, perfect. So this, we're done with linear algebra. Now back to probability. So we, uh, this is again, I apologize if you know that already, but I would like to set up this, the, the setting for random vectors in general. So if you have a random, we, we're working in high dimensions now, right? So X is an R D is a random vector. I would like to define the notion of mean and variance. The mean is obvious. So the mean, the notion of the mean for a random vector is the same as the notion of the mean for random variables. In fact, you can just take the mean by coordinate. Okay. But the notion of variance is different. The notion of variance for random variables in one dimension, if x was a 
uh, was a random variable, if it was in one dimension, then the variance is this expected value of x minus mean squared. Or alternatively, if you open up the, the square, you would get this. And collect, simplify. Yeah, this is familiar, right? That's, that's, that's just a classic, two, two classic definition, equivalent definitions of the variance. But what do we do if if we have uh, if we have high dimensions, dimension higher than one? Uh, what is the analog of the of the notion of variance? Covariance matrix. Exactly, covariance matrix. So variance actually becomes a matrix then. So in higher dimensions, the variance becomes a matrix itself, and that's called covariance matrix. Covariance matrix. I don't know, maybe cov. Uh, I don't know what's the standard notation. Maybe cov of x. Okay, how do we set it up? We we'll look at this definition, the classical one and try to, to emulate the classical definition expected value, all right? X minus mu, we can still write that. Now we need to square it, but the, we can't square a vector, right? There's no such notion as squaring, squaring or not, not a natural notion of the square of the vector. So we need to multiply this vector by itself somehow. And we do it this way, X minus mu, X minus mu transpose. If you multiply x minus mu by x minus mu transpose, you get like column times row, and you get this way as a, a, a matrix, like n by n matrix. Okay. <laughs> now, if you do the same trick as here, you open up the square and collect the similar terms, you will see, and this is a little exercise to check, you will see that you can also write this expected value of x squared, which in this case is xx transpose minus mu square, which is mu, mu transpose. <laughs> so we have a, an analog of one dimensional definition, but in higher dimensions, a matrix version, matrix version of, of variance. But that's called covariance matrix. Good. The entries of the covariance matrix, covariance x, i, j, covariance matrix, the i, j entry, let's just think. Okay, so how do we multiply x by itself? Sorry, let me just mute this. So how do we multiply a vector? So that will be, you take the x, okay, so x, x transpose. Eh? So think just x, let's, let's think x, x transpose. What's the i, j's entry of that? That's the i's entry of x times j's entry of the transpose. Right. So it will be xi times xj. So the covariance matrix is just multiplying um, the i's entry of x minus mu times j's entry of x minus mu. And this is, of course, xi minus mu i. And mu i is just expected value times xj minus mu j, and mu j is the expected value of j coordinate. And, and that is, yeah, well, that is a miraculously, that's, that's a standard notion of covariance of two random variables, xi and xj. That's, that's what covariance is by definition. Yeah, cool. Okay, so what's a covariance matrix then? Covariance matrix is a storage for all pairwise covariances of the coordinates. So random vector is a collection of D uh, random variables and the covariance matrix just stores all of their pairwise covariances. It's, it's a storage unit for, that shows how of, of all the dependencies between this, um, these random variables. Good. The diagonal entries of the covariance matrix. So X, I, I. Well, that's easy now. So it's covariance of xi, xi. So it's expected value of xi minus this times itself, which is what? If you take i equal j here, you would get what? Get the variance, right? You just a square of that. So the variance. That is 
the covariance of xi with itself, which is a variance of xi perfect. So it also has the variances. The covariance matrix is, has the variances of the components, just like it's supposed to do, because it's supposed to be the notion of a variance in high dimensions. But also it has the, all the covariances, all the pairwise dependencies. For example, if x is is um, is a random vector for in two dimensions, then the covariance matrix is let's see. So on the diagonal we have variances. Off diagonal we have covariances. Here we go. And the, uh, clearly the notion of covariance is symmetric. So this is a symmetric matrix. Right. Yeah, so far so good. I'm going a little bit faster on this because I know that some, you, this, this should be kind of known already. So generally, covariance matrix is, is um, what, a, D by D matrix, it is symmetric. Just because the notion of covariance is symmetric. This is obvious. It's less obvious that it is a positive semi-definite matrix, but it is almost obvious too. It's a positive semi-definite matrix. Let's check. So what is positive semi-definite means? Let's remember. We it means that any quadratic form of this type, V transpose, let's call it sigma for, let's call this sigma. Yeah, sigma is a covariance matrix. So V positive semi-definite means that V transpose sigma V, this type of quadratic form must always be non-negative, always takes non-negative values, no matter what V is. Let's check. Direct check, V transpose, what's sigma? Sigma is expected value of, uh, of uh, X minus mu, X minus mu transpose. Let's call it Y, Y transpose. Where Y is X minus mu, just to simplify notation. Yeah, good. Okay, cool. Expected value is linear, so we can pull it out like this, it's expected value of V transpose Y, Y transpose V. Yeah, so far so good, good. Now V transpose Y, that's the inner product between uh, Y and V. And Y transpose V is also the inner product between Y and V. And so we have the expected value of Y, V, squared, which is always non-negative. We win, here we go. Good. In fact, it may be a, a good idea to just think of what it really is. Let's see, expected value of yv, what is this? y is x minus mu, so let's write it down. It's x minus mu v squared. So that looks like a variance. It looks like a variance of this, of a projection of x, of x onto the direction of v. Variance of x. Of, a, of, of projection of X onto the direction of V. If we have these old points and, and if this is zero, maybe uh, then this is X, maybe this is actually mu. <laughs> like this. And we project all these points on this line and then we have the variance. Good. Okay, so that's that's all about the covariance. Just very basic things about covariance. Um, summary is that for random variables we have the notion of mean and variance. For random vectors 
we have the notion of mean, same thing, just and covariance. So the variance becomes a matrix now. Good. Okay. You guys know all that. Anyway. Okay. Cool. One example, hold with me, probably you know that too. Example is a high dimensional normal distribution. High dimensional normal distribution. We know what the random, what the normal in, in one dimension is, not just normal random variable. Now we make a random vector, normal random vector. Just put them together, Z1, Z2, Zd, let's say. Let's call this a standard uh, normal random vector. If all the i's, all the coordinates are standard, normal, and independent random variables. Okay. That just like in the homework, you have already that in the homework. So we put a vector whose, independent, whose coordinates are independent and st standard normals, that's called standard normal random vector, perfect. Obviously has mean zero, right? And variance or covariance, in covariance. So on the diagonal, there should be variances of the components, and the variances are all one. Right? Just because they're standard normals, variances are one. Off the diagonal, we have covariances, and they're independent, and the covariance therefore are zero. So it's identity in dimension D. So the covariance is identity matrix. And for this matter, we for, for this reason we we uh, we adopt this notation that z is standard normal with variance uh, mean zero and covariance identity analogous to n of zero one. So now we have zero identity. One becomes identity. Very very clear. Okay. Good. The probability density function PDF, the density of uh, of of z is let's think. So it's a joint distribution of independent random variables. Right? The density of the density of a joint distribution of independent random variables factors. It is a product. Remember that? That's actually almost a definition. It's the equivalent thing. So the density factors. It's f of x1, f of x2, f of xd, where little, each little f is a density of each individual component. And what are they? Well, it's the components are standard normal. So they're like this, x1 squared over 2, and so on, xd squared over 2. which are standard normals, and we can collect them together. Well, let's do it in one step. So this factor, the, the, the one over two pi, root of two pi factor becomes one over two pi to the power d over two. I just multiply them all, that's clear. And now we can bring all of the exponents into a single exponent. Okay, so the, the exponents will add up to minus, Minus something something divided by two. Now, what is that something something? That's x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared and so on and so forth, which is a Euclidean norm of x. So I can just write it as x Euclidean norm squared over two. Yeah, so that's my f of x. Perfect. Very clean, right? The, in one dimension, it's e to the minus x squared over two. In high dimensions, norm of x squared over two. Very, very clean. An important consequence of this is that this density, and this is very important actually, this, this density does not depend on the direction of x. It only depends on the norm of x, on the length. And therefore it is rotationally invariant. If I rotate x, I would have exactly the same number. So um, 
f of x equals f of let's say ux if I rotate for any orthogonal matrix u that realizes this rotation and therefore the, the and therefore the Gauss the normal distribution has the rotation invariance property rotation invariance property which we'll need in the next homework actually so tell me if I'm uh, if, if all of this is clear to you so if we have um if okay sorry so if z is a standard normal random vector then then so is uz also standard normal random vector for any orthogonal matrix u All clear? Any questions? I'm going. I know I'm going fast here because I know some of you. Okay. Do did you get, do you know actually know this? <laughs> right? Did, have you have you done this before? At least I did. I guess a lot of people do. A lot of people did. Okay. Kate Besverbna, do you know that? Have you have you studied this before? Yeah. Okay. Hey, do you, did, you, did you study this? I wanted to stick it from some people who didn't. Yeah. But you said I didn't hear. Oh, okay. Uh, did you study this material before, like normal distribution? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Well, I'll go with the same speed then. I will not slow down. Uh, cool. So generally, we now are going from the standard normal distribution to arbitrary normal distribution arbitrary normal distribution. So definition, x is a random vector x is a general normal random vector if, if it is obtained from the standard normal by some translation and dilation. If um, if X is an let's say an affine transformation, that's what I mean by translation and dilation. You shrink, you compress, you rotate, you move around. Affine transformation of the standard normal, namely X is a times z plus mu. For some matrix A, it should be invertible, but let's forget that for a moment, D by D, and mu, a vector, fixed vector. So we move it around and we, we do something like linear transformation, that's it. Okay, so if we do that, the expected value of X, well, it was zero, now we add mu, so obviously it should be mu. And we just moved it by mu. The covariance matrix of X, Let's compute it quickly, expected value. All right, so this is X. So what's covariance mean? I subtract the mean, I get AZ, and I do AZ, AZ, AZ transpose. Yeah, so it's X minus mu times X minus mu transpose. So that's, that's AZ, AZ transpose. Okay, let's open this up. AZ, now the transpose, remember it switches the order, Z transpose A. We get we can pull a out by linearity expected value of z z transpose times a oh yeah, I forgot about one transpose here transpose good and this is identity because z is standard normal so the covariance matrix was identity so it disappears and we get a a transpose cool so that's our covariance matrix a a transpose. And the probability density function of this new vector, well, it's a 
It's an exercise in Jacobians. You, you get this standard density, and then you apply the affine transformation. Right? So you just do this affine transformation, and you compute the Jacobian and do this. Compute the Jacobian, and clearly it will be some, some kind of affine transformation of the original density. So I'll just write it down. Uh, and I, I don't, you don't have to remember this little mess, but it's OK. Determinant of sigma, root of determinant of sigma. And then there is x of minus x minus mu transpose sigma x minus mu over two. This is the density. Whatever it is. So that's some some transform. The, oops. The, the point is that the standard density, rotation invariant density, also maybe I'll switch here, this one the standard density is rotation invariant. So it looks like this, it looks like a hat. And it's level sets. If I, if I cut it by horizontal surfaces, the level sets are, run, are, are circles. Uh, when we do the linear, the affine transformation and we get this general density, it's not a hat anymore. It's kind of a hat that's moved around and we shrink it or, or compress it in some directions. And if we slice it horizontally, the level sets are ellipses or ellipsoids. That's the only difference. The reason I put up this, the density here, the explicit form of the density is one thing. It, it gives us a clear message that the density and therefore the distribution of normal random variable only depends on two parameters, mu appearing here and sigma appearing here. Actually it should be sigma inverse. So the, the density depends on two parameters, mu and sigma, and therefore the, the whole distribution depends on just these two parameters. So it's completely determined uh, so that the, the normal distribution, although we define it this, this way, it's determined completely by two parameters. So P, uh, normal distribution is uniquely determined by mean, mu, and covariance. Sigma is a two parametric family in a sense. So X run the variable, and this justifies the notation that X is normal with mean mu and covariance matrix sigma just like we uh, we write for a variable n of mu and then little sigma squared now we have this now little sigma squared becomes a big matrix sigma Okay, any questions so far? We're good? No questions, okay, good. This is still a background. Um, how many of you know principal component analysis? It's theoretical background. I do. Olga, what did you say? You do, don't you? Yes. Yes, okay. How many of you do not know principal component <laughs> analysis? Just raise your, your little hand. I, I don't wanna talk about something that you all know. Uh, yeah, oh, everybody knows, really. Okay, good. Okay, you don't know, fine. No shame. Perfect, that's why I'm here. Very quickly. So, because uh, we'll need it anyway. Let's, let's go over this quickly. Principle, component, analysis. Anyway. So, for, just for simplicity, suppose we have the, the random variable, random vector, sorry, with, with mean zero. And if it's not mean zero, just move it, just translate it back so it has mean zero for simplicity. And let's say covariance matrix, let's call it sigma. Think of X as a data, as a distribution, uh, distribution of our population. Maybe it's a genetic, Ex expression of genes uh, in a person. Okay, so each 
so x you take a random person from the world and, and x measures the expression of the genes d genes what you want to do with this is the g is very large it's in the thousands you would like to reduce the dimension And, and the best way of reducing the dimension, just like we saw in johnson Lindershaw, johnson Lindershaw is one way to do this. And it's a completely blind method. It's just take a random projection and project whatever it is. <laughs> it's not adapted to the data. And it still gives some good results. However, a, a, a more data-informed way would be actually to look at the distribution before you project, to find the, the best possible projection. So we project, we want to project X onto, a, let's say one dimension. Let's, let's start with, with a crazy projection, one dimensional line that uh, let's say explains the best, exp ah, I don't know how to say it, best explains the, the, vari the, the, um, the variability, the variation. of X that best explains how, how X, uh, the geometry of X, if you like. So here's here is the idea. Here is the picture. Let's say this is our line, these are points. Sorry, let me do this picture. So this is the points. Think of this as data. So it, it really, there is a population, but I don't know how to draw the entire population. So there is like a points like this maybe. And I would like to find the line that best explains it, best explains the variability. Uh, for example, this line, this line, well, this line will be bad. It doesn't explain a lot. What the best line would be at uh, this line. If I project onto that line, X will be very, very different. I will see a lot of variability. So maybe that is a good idea. So let me take the zero through the centroid, through the mean. And, and project it. And how do we project? So this is, let's say, take a unit vector here, unit vector of corresponding to that line. And when we project a point, let's say this point, this will be my X. When we project a point X on this line like this here. So what is this? This will become X U uh, times U. I guess this is a projection. So we would like to find to find the line which is determined by the unit vector. To find a unit vector u, actually v. Let's call it v. V. Sorry. That maximizes. The variation, the variance of the projection that maximizes the variance of this random variable x inner product with v. That's the length of the uh, of the point. Okay. Good. So this is what is expected value of x v squared. Good. Okay, let's open it up. It's expected value of, I can represent XV as V transpose X, one copy, and the other is X transpose V. One inner product, the other inner product together, and then pull out V. By linearity. And we get V transpose sigma V because this is the covariance matrix of X. So V transpose sigma V. Okay, so we would like to maximize it. So I'm, I'm run, running the, ma the, the optimization here. So maximize over all unit vectors of this quadratic form V transpose. Sigma V. What's this maximum mm -hmm. from linear algebra, from the optimization meaning of, of, of 
V transpose sigma V. I'm optimizing, maximize the quadratic form. And what maximize? What's the maximizer? Biggest tension value. Yeah, exactly. The, the the biggest eigenvalue. Yes. Exactly. So this is this is actually here. Right? For any match, any symmetric metrics, and it, this one is symmetric. If we if maximize this quadratic form, the maximum would be the the top eigenvalue, and the vector that maximizes it is the top eigenvector. So let me put it down here. So this becomes lambda one of sigma, and the arg max, the maximizer, top eigenvalue, and the maximizer. Uh, of this thing, the solution would be v1 of sigma, the, the corresponding top eigenvector. Perfect, so that's a recipe, right? You want the best direction, you take the covariance metrics, you, you, and you project onto the top eigenvector. And the variance will be given by the top eigenvalue, very clear. And that's one dimensional projection, but for visual purposes that, that you want to, Reduce dimension not to dimension one probably, but dimension two or three, and you can keep going, right? So, what's the next best, next best direction in space that explains the variability of x? Well, what you do, you take this line. Obviously, we you have already you already have this line. Then you uh, take the residual. So, forget about that direction. Project everything onto the orthogonal subspace like this. And then run this iterate, then run the same optimization. So you, you find the best direction in the orthogonal subspace. So you maximize over V that's or, orthogonal to the first one that we already found of the same quadratic form, the variance of, of the inner product. So you maximize the variance of that. And well, not surprisingly, right, that now we again run the same argument about the maximization here. Where is it? The next one would be lambda two, the next top eigenvector and the next top eigenvalue. So we back here, so we'll get the second one, lambda two of sigma, and the arg max would be v two of sigma. And we go down. Let's say we stop at dimension two, then the recipe is just to project X onto these two directions, onto the plane, on the two dimensional plane. Spanned by the top two eigenvectors, V1 and V2. Project the plane, look at the picture, that's it. So this justifies this method that's called PCA, the principal component analysis, to reduce, and the method is this, to reduce dimension of X from, from dimension D, the original one, to let's say dimension K, usually two or three maybe. We project X, onto the subspace spanned by the top k eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of x. These two eigenvectors are called principal components and, that, and thus the name. principal components of the data of X. And why do you do this? Is that this subspace, this, this projection explains the variability of X the best among all K dimensional subspaces.
So this is the best projection that explains the most about the variability of X. Okay. Good. Okay. This was a crash course in principal component analysis. Very quickly, it really is it's, the advantage is it has a theoretical backing, unlike other methods available like neural networks. Uh, actually, do you know any? Uh, oh, wait. Let, let me show you some pictures and, and then we'll discuss discuss the advantages and disadvantages of this. Any questions about the PCA, the, the theoretical part of it? No? Okay. So now you can just code it, right? You just take sigma. It's beautiful, right? Because sigma itself, the covariance matrix, originally, like we defined it, is just a storage unit for variances and, and covariances between the components. You just look at this matrix, you just see the covariance, the dependencies between different points. But the hidden information there is not in the components, not in the entries of the matrix. The hidden information is in the spectrum. So there is this basis, the basis of eigenvectors in which there is the real action is going on. And when you do that, when you diagonalize sigma, it reveals the singular vector singular. And that is in that basis, the, 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 the data looks the best, all right? So here is how it works. I just, I did it myself, some of this, but some of it I took from the internet. Um, see, I'll see. Okay, so here's, here's the experiment actual experiment with the with the genomic data you, you take genomes gene sequencing the expression expression of genes of different individuals and this is what you you do like there are, there are companies like 24 and me other companies that you spit in the tube and and they do the genetic analysis and they have this d-dimensional so d d genes for each individual you you collect a lot of individuals and then you do the pca two principal components on that data so here's what you see this is the world's data uh, and it's amazing it beautifully clusters uh, people of different descent so european african and asian descent you already see just on the level of this this two two principal components that there is there is, there is a big variability um, and it explains it, it shows how much variance is actually explained so this is world then then you can have fun and maybe zoom in into let's say asian or zoom in into european and try to just do the pca of that uh, and we do that and let's say this is asia I'm not sure if how, how much you see here but there's kazakhstan like, like clustered and uzbekistan is clustered amazingly and there is siberia which is totally separate uh, and kalash i don't know what, what kalash is I think it's like Pakistan, maybe. And, uh, yeah, it's Central Asia. So that's 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 Asia, Central Asia, and and you can do this for European. And this is Europe. This is us. Some of us. Uh, there is what? Uh -huh. There is what's this? How is this? Is Finland? <laughs> Finland is totally separate, along with. Finland. Oh, okay, this is still Finland. There are two that are different. Finland is, there are different kind of tribes in, in Finland, but they're nicely clustered. Orthogonal to all of Europe, actually. So you, <laughs> the other Europe is like this, and Finland is orthogonal to that. And this is Spain. And on the other end, on the other end point of Finland is Italy, southern Italy, which is <laughs> geographically justified, but genetically, who knows? So this is actually true too and and switzerland maintains its neutrality it's completely separate from anything else in, i don't know why because it looks like switzerland is should be a mix of everything but the, in the center of europe but it's actually is, is a isn't isn't that kind of an outlier there is more switzerland close to uh oh, oh yeah you're to, right yeah oh i didn't see that yeah yeah there's there's more of switzerland yeah Okay, that makes sense. Switzerland, there's Northern Italy, there's okay, Southern Italy, Southern Italy, Northern Italy, Switzerland, which makes a lot of sense. And fortunately, there is no Ukraine there in this data. Anyway, so that's, 
that's that. Okay. Now let me ask you guys, what, so this is PCA, it's a date advantages. It's a totally, um, how do you say it? It's, it's an exploratory data tool, which means that you don't have to know anything before you run it. You just, just put this data like in the juice maker. Like you put the data, the raw data, or maybe you normalize it, but you put the data there and it spits you the answer. So you don't have to formulate any hypotheses. You don't, it's just purely an, uh, an exploratory data analysis. Uh, in machine learning, that's, that's called unsupervised learning in the sense that we don't need to know labels. Like unlike the other clustering, remember this clustering thing, the, the separate SVD, you know, the SVM support vector machines. There we did have to know the labels to separate this. Like who has cancer, who has not cancer, who is Italy and who is Finland. Here we don't need to know that. Just just raw data, unsupervised, no labels. So that's that's where it is good. It is good that it has theoretical backing, and we just discovered it. So the theoretical backing is here is the two uh, two components that explain the most very most genetic variability in 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 people's population. So this is and and here is how much we can actually show that it. Experimentally, we say this is 6.8, this is 3.1%. So it actually is, is very theoretically um, solid method. Do you guys know, know any other methods that any other data, data, I would say visualizing method, visualization methods? You mean for uh, explanatory analysis? Explore, um, yeah, yeah, same, same thing like here. What else can you do with this data? To maybe, if, if this, if this didn't work, then what, what would you do? Well, sometimes I use uh, box plots, but that for uh, the predefined clusters. Yes, that that's true. So that's box plot, right? Box. Yeah. Plot. Yeah, that's that is not. I think this is like supervised learning. So you already have to know something about the data, the clusters. Yeah. What else? Well, clustering. Uh, if we... Yeah. Yeah. Clustering. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> clustering. Uh, yes. Uh, or, 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 I was yeah. just about to tell you about that. If we don't know anything about data, we can run some clustering algorithms like uh, K means or maybe K medoids. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. K means. Well, K means actually you have to selecting K is is problematic sometimes, but uh, uh, there are other unsupervised clustering like like I don't know hierarchical clustering or something like that. Yes. Works. Fine so, too. Uh, clustering. Okay. So that it actually it answers a question, not the one that I asked. I ask, but it's it's still a, a good answer. So it's a data exploratory tool. It's clustering. You just run some clustering, maybe K means, maybe other hierarchical clustering, tree based clustering, and it it would give you some some clusters. Great. Um, but I was asking about the visualization. So what? How do you then visualize it? Okay, so have you heard, let's see, um, TC, UMAP? Okay. I haven't. Yeah, but okay, All right, something to, that, that you may consider next time if you have, uh, so TC and UMAP, they are kind of nonlinear, nonlinear uh, visualization tool. The disadvantage, okay, the advantage of, of PCA is clear. I, I told that the disadvantage of PCA is that one, it is a linear method. It assumes, first of all, it, it kind of runs this, this assumption that uh, the bigger, the better. Right? So that if I project on the subspace where X is spread the most, that is where I will see the information. That's where I will see the clusters and everything. That's not always true. Especially if I if the clusters are small, maybe maybe there are two big clusters like this, and there are many clusters like that, and so it's not always true that the bigger where, where, where things spread the most, there is most information, and PCA just finds the the the, 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 be, the best spread. There are other methods that are more aware of of local structure. One way you can do this is 
is combine PCA with kernel methods. Right? So you kernelize the data, you define the local kind of distance that kind of low is local, maybe with, with radial basis functions, and then you'd run PCA. So that's that's one so you, you can do the kernel kernel PCA. Um, the off-the-shelf tools that are available are TSNI and, and UMAP, which, which are kind of non-linear dimension reduction, and they work pretty well, much better. Some, in many occasions, they work better than PCA. The disadvantage of TSNI and UMAP is that nothing is known almost, right? That we don't know how things converge. It, we don't know if things are stable. And if we see the, the nice pictures, we don't know if they are real. <laughs> Uh, how do you, there is no theoretical backing. We, we see something, maybe there's an artifact of the argument. And sometimes we, 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 we make these algorithms to, like we train them with the optimize, we, we optimize them so that they reveal some structure. And sometimes they, how do we know they don't fool us, right? Maybe they just give us the structures that we want, <laughs> we want them to, to produce. And, and maybe there is just artifacts, we don't know. So this is, uh, it's, there are advantages and disadvantages of TSNI and, and UMAP. There are, there are probably the, the methods that are the most popular in the in dimension reduction visualization techniques. Yeah. You can combine PCA with uh, with K means, for example. K means is pretty fast, right? It doesn't suffer with dimension at all, or most of it. But but if if there is a lot of dimension, and I, I, I ran into some some of this when we had the entire system of, um, of veterans in the United States, it's a it's very large, like millions and of patients, and and the history is like thousands of entries, and so you, this matrix you can't really put in anything. So you can run PCA first, and then. After PCA, you can combine it with some methods. So that's that's what people normally do too. Yeah. Any any questions or observations? Okay. What happens next? PCA is great. We have the theoretical backing, but we missed one very important thing, and it could be a trap. And this generally. So, and I'll explain what it is. All of the idea of PCA is based on our access to the entire population. Right? When we say, when we say something like this, a sigma, sigma is a covariance matrix. It's based on the axis of the covariance matrix, and the covariance matrix is expected value of xx transpose and this expected value is averaging over the entire population over the entire world of people so if i if i show you this picture that this you know chinese Japanese, european african are nicely clustered it's it's based on the on the data that we have how do we know how do we know that it has a reality beyond the, the particular data how do we know that the pictures that we are seeing are, are real. Um, but the finite sample that we have is enough to run PCA. And of course, as classical st statisticians, we say, well, but we'll have more, just, just take a bigger sample and we'll be fine. And it is true in dimension one. If the data, let's say, has dimension one, that's a classical statistics is saying that, right? You, you have more, you want to estimate the mean, fine, just take this sample and you have this confidence interval, fine. But now we're we're facing a lot of dimensions here, and like half of this course is about this this uh, curse of high dimensionality. How do we know this things doesn't suffer from curse of high dimensionality? How do we know that the sample, the finite sample, that's needed to to run PCA, uh, can be can be well in the worst case? Let's say here's a, here's a nightmare. That in order to run PCA, you need exponentially many samples in the dimension. So that would be a, a curse of high dimensionality. Do we? And if, if it is so, then, then 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 the pictures that we're seeing are, are just nonsense. They're they're artifacts of of the method. And it is not clear. 
at least not immediately clear whether this suffers or not suffer from, from the curse of high dimensionality. Certainly, you cannot have the sample size that's less than the dimension. Or maybe not certainly, but kind of. Because if you have sample size that's less than the dimension, then it would be flat. It would, right? If the dimension is d and the sample is like d half, then, then the whole sample is in the d over two dimensional subspace. And the covariance metrics will lack these directions, orthogonal directions. So covariance metrics will, will not have full rank. And there is, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> so that, that's pro probably, it's not, we can do that, I don't know. So the sample has to exceed the, the dimension. But does it have to exceed it exponentially high or, or maybe like linearly high? So this is what we, what we would like to do next. Uh, so it's Monday and Wednesday, we will, we will study this problem. How large sample do we need in order to run PCA? And what happens if we don't have the, enough sample? And there's a beautiful picture, beautiful answers to this. Well understood now, but it's still very, very beautiful. Uh, can you give an idea what do you mean by can we run PCA? So what are we aiming for? Yeah, sorry, we, of course we can always run PCA. We just put this data in the computer no matter what and it spits us some answers. And, and this is the answer, so here's the answer. The problem is, do we know that this picture rep truly represents the patterns in the, in the human population? Or maybe in the nightmare case, the worst case is that this, uh, this picture only represents the patterns in the sample itself. Do you know what I mean? Like this finite sample is not enough. So we were chasing the patterns in the in the finite sample, and really this this it's like overfitting problem. Like we're just just looking at the sample. We we look at the at the structure of the sample, and really it has nothing to do with the, with the population. How do we go from finite sample to population? So that's that's a problem. Um, okay, did, did I answer your question? Kinda, yeah. Okay, I, I, I guess I guess we in in the next lecture we'll formalize what do you mean by yeah, pattern. We'll, we'll yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'll we'll formulate what we mean. Yeah, in the next next class more formally, but but philosophically it's it's always this question: How do we? Um, yeah, if, if there's let's say the PCA finds the the, the direction that best maximizes the variance, right? It best maximizes the variance of the sample. What if the direction that maximizes the variance in the population is totally orthogonal, to it, for example? That will be a nightmare scenario. Right? You're, you're looking at the, you're projecting onto a completely wrong, wrong subspace, and you're seeing these pictures that have nothing to do with, with reality, with the population. So that's, that, would be a, that would be a bad situation. It will actually not happen. We'll, we'll justify the, the, the PCA. Uh, the finite sample PCA, but but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll make it more rigorous, I guess. And that that is what you have not seen, I think. Uh, unlike the material that we did in this background last class and this class, probably you've seen that already. Most of them. Good. Any other questions? Recording now.